Good evening, everyone. My name is Charlie Collins, and I'd like to welcome everybody to the East Hampton Library for the Tom Toomey Lecture Series today on uh, All About Oysters. Uh, just to introduce our guests quick, uh, the first one is Barley Dunn. Uh, Barley is the director of the East Hampton Town Shellfish Hatchery. Barley has studied oysters his entire professional career, starting in the Peace Corps in the Solomon Islands to today, where he's the director of the hatchery since 2011. He has a master's degree in fisheries and aquaculture from Auburn University. And our next guest is Adam Yunus. Adam is the Bay Management Specialist at the East Hampton Town Shellfish Hatchery and the owner slash operator of Promised Land Shellfish, producer of Lazy Point Oysters. Originally from Texas, Adam holds a master's in marine science from Stony Brook University. He has worked at the town hatchery since 2015. And our moderator for this evening is Sarah Davison. Sarah is the president of the East Hampton Library and executive director of the Friends of Georgia Capon Foundation. I uh, just want to make sure everybody knows that after the lecture is over, uh, please join us in the courtyard upstairs for some oysters and complimentary beer from the Montauk Brewing Company. fishing my whole life. I've been fishing for a living, working my hands and bleeding on the decks of all the boats here and up in Northport where I was born since I was eight years old. Now I am actually making a living and giving back to the bay that supported me for 40 years. I started out clamming, moved into uh, harvesting oysters from the wild. Predominantly all winter long we are harvesting to market the final product and we're building new equipment or restoring old equipment. It's just like the oysters have cycles throughout the year, we follow those cycles. So coming out of the winter we'll be raising the submerged oysters which are submerged in cages. We'll be raising those cages and uh, we'll be transferring the oysters from cage bags, which don't have floats on them, into floating bags to bring them up to the surface for the surface season. So we tumble the oysters several times a year. The oysters are dumped onto a table. Seaweed and macroalgae pulled out from the pile. They're rinsed and pushed through the machine that grades them to size, turns them against one another, and then they're rebagged and planted again. As they grow, they take up more space in the bag, and so when you start out, you might have a thousand baby oysters in a bag. If you just left them alone, you'd have a hundred survivors at the end of the year. But when you empty it out as they grow, and just put two gallons into a six-gallon bag, then the oysters have the space to get their food and not compete with one another, and they can grow and, and stay clean. So the, the idea is to keep the density at a manageable level, which we really should take some lessons from. So we do our best to help create the best environment for the oyster, meaning only simply to keep a direct access to the natural things that an oyster would in the wild. The whole idea of this surface grow-out system is to keep the oysters up on the surface for a couple of different reasons. One being that the nutrient level is a little bit richer. There's also different nutrients up on the surface of the water. Right where the strongest low tide interacts with the tidal wetlands, that's a primo spot for shellfish. And the reason is, that's where the surface water is interacting most with the bottom.
you're looking at out here is the remnants of our surface grow-out system, which is our nursery area. The floating bags house our youngest oysters. We normally have 4,500 bags floating on the surface of the water like a vineyard of the sea. They're arranged with auger anchors, 320 feet long with an anchor in the middle. Our work schedule is year-round. We are in the water in February. There's icebergs, we're still in the water. We wear a six mil wetsuit with rain gear over it and we can get in the water and, and get things done. Throughout our farm, we're walking. It's high tide right now, so we'll be walking in water this deep. It's considered unnavigable waters. The reason why we are able to get this approved here, it's so shallow, boats were running aground. I feel that now that I have a, a foothold in shellfish aquaculture and knowing that the East End is a prime location for shellfish aquaculture, I would be honored to be able to carry it forward a notch. I'd like to start a shellfish aquaculture program in the town where commercial guys like me could go and set up a farm and actually give back to the bay and respect the bay. I'd like to work with kids and adults and take them out, show them what we do and how we do it. And I also have some really good ideas for expanding aquaculture on a level that would provide a lot of protein for the life force right here from Montauk. Farming is hard work, and um, we are so fortunate in this town to have a shellfish hatchery. Not every town has one, and Barley uh, does a magnificent job of running the hatchery, uh, and Adam works with him and has his own side business of oyster farming. So Barley, why don't you just take a minute and tell us about the town hatchery and what you do and what your mission is. Uh, hi, good evening. Um, yeah, so the East Hampton Town Shellfish Hatchery was started back in the 80s by my predecessor, John Aldred. Um, and it was in response to the brown tide. I'm sure most of you heard about the brown tide, which swept through the really the whole East Coast and wiped out a lot of the shellfish populations and the eelgrass populations. So a lot of hatcheries sprung up to try and help to re restock the populations of shellfish that were lost. Is there anybody saying So since the, the late 80s, we've been in operation. We have a hatchery in Montauk and a nursery on Three Mile Harbor, and we have a field grow-out grow out site in uh, Nat Peeg Harbor. So we grow oysters, clams, and scallops every year. Uh, we start in the hatchery in, in January, getting the, the oysters ready to spawn, start spawning in February. And we're getting, a, basically we're getting a jump start on the season, uh, sort of like your, your lamb nurseries do by starting seed in the nursery. We start indoors and get a nice, uh, 
healthy crop going. Uh, this time of the year, uh, we're wrapping up the season and we're starting to seed our shellfish. Our oysters are around average of about two inches uh, from this year's crop. Clams are the size of a dime or a nickel or so, and, and scallops are the size of about a silver dollar. So every season, every year, we go through this cycle. We grow the crop of a few million oysters, several million clams, and a few hundred thousand scallops, seed those all throughout town, and just repeat the process each year. The, the purpose is to try and keep the culture of, of shell fishing alive on the East End, as well as these shellfish have a huge water quality component where they, they're filter feeders, so they're constantly filtering water, providing habitat, and, and, and they're part of, the, part of the solution in keeping our waters as beautiful as they are. Great. Is, is that what you think Mike is saying when he's giving back to the Bay? Yeah, I think so. I think, uh, you know, this is one, one industry where you actually you, you provide benefit to the environment, whereas other industries, you know, we need to provide food. Uh, the, the beauty of growing shellfish, these filter feeders, is that we don't have, there's no inputs into the farm. The farm that you saw on the screen there, there's no, nothing be, being added aside from the gear and the oysters themselves, and they just feed on the ambient, ambient algae that's available. So that's part of the giving back. So Adam, I understand that this is the first year Lazy Point oysters have come to market. Congratulations. Tell us a little bit about your struggle and hard work to get a, an oyster farm going. Um, so there's, I guess uh, it starts with uh, just kind of going through the permitting process once you've uh, determined that you actually want to do uh, an oyster farm. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it's, you know, so once you go through the permitting process, which takes about a year, um, and you're purchasing gear in the meantime and kind of uh, getting ready, um, the, you know, I think one of the, one obstacle that I ran into with my farm was um, what is described in our industry as NIMBY, which is not in my backyard. And so um, there were, uh, mm -hmm. private entities uh, near uh, my farm that didn't want me there. So that was kind of my first hurdle, um, was, dealing, was dealing with that. And then after that, it's just, um, it's mother nature, and just staying on top of uh, the maintenance schedule and, and making sure that the oysters have a, a clean, healthy place to, to grow. So let's uh, dive right into the commercial uh, industry and the, the use conflicts in the bays, not in my back bay, right? Because uh, <clears throat> um, there's been a few in town, and um, the pictures of Mike's cages were very clear that it can take a sizable amount of space, and I guess he said he got his because it was so shallow that it was not navigable. So was your uh, underwater land in a navigable area? Um, you know, according to the Coast Guard, it, it's depending, you know, they have different definitions of how they, um, but it's navigable, I guess it's navigable um, up to a certain extent, um, but it's also usable for aquaculture. Right, so right. Both can exist. So both can exist. I mean, there, there's a, a long tra tradition of um, harvesting seafood out here and of course, a huge tradition of tourism and the beauty of the bays, and how do we reconcile, um, you know, a working waterfront with um, recreational use of the waterfront? Is you know, it's an interesting question. You go to states like Maine, you see, you know, huge um, industrial, well, not industrial, but commercial use of the waterfront. Um, you know, what what's your vision for our waterfront here in terms of balancing? Uh, Farm, oyster farming and recreation. You know that's that's a very difficult question. Uh, as I'm just now getting into the, uh, it's hard to uh, decipher what what will happen in the future. But I think um, is that as long as everybody keeps cool heads and um, the, the the aquaculture community, is, you know. We, we do this type of work because we love the water, 
not just because we're trying to get rich, which we're not. <laughs> um, and so it, it, it's in our nature to, to, to take care of the Bay. And I think um, that can also coexist with uh, recreational uses. It has to. Barley, your thoughts on that? Can you tell us where your where can, barn is? Yes, it's in uh, Gardner's Bay. Okay. We'll take questions at the end, okay? Thanks. Um, yeah, I concur with Adam in that there's, there needs to be some, some compromise and some sharing. You know, in this, when the, the Suffolk County Aquaculture Lease Program first was established way back in 2009 or so, um, they might have made a, a, a little bit of a mistake by drawing a map which showed really the, the majority of the conic in Gardner's Bays as being available for aquaculture. And it kind of shocked some people and made them think that, oh, no, the whole, the whole system is going to be overcome with, with, with farms. But the reality is that they've, they've only allocated less than 1% of the entire area from Flanders to Napi for aquaculture. So there's plenty, you know, there's, there's never going to be a, a monopoly of the, of the bays for aquaculture. It's a very, very small percentage of the, of the bay. And, and just to get, put it in perspective, some of the other successful states like Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Maine, they figure about 5% of their, their water bodies can be allotted to aquaculture, and it's still kind of a fair balance. That sounds pretty fair. I think it's so interesting to see the cages and the activity. I think, you know, it is, in Maine, I know it's a, it is a tourist draw to go look at the shipbuilding and the, and the commercial docks. It, it, you know, it's, it's quite, quite interesting. So let's, let's drill down a little bit on the water purifying role, the ecological role of the oyster. Um, I know you, you, at the hatchery, you have these huge tubs of oysters, but you have even more huge tubs of algae, yellow and green vats, of giant vats of stuff growing, which is the food of the oyster, right? So, and I know the oyster opens its shell and somehow water goes in and then somehow it spits the water out, but in the, tell us exactly what's going on there and how it sequesters nitrogen and eats the algae and purifies. Uh, sure, so I have an oyster shell here to kind of try and put things into perspective. So this is the bottom the bottom valve, so when the oyster, if the oyster were whole, there'd be another shell on top here, right? So that's the oyster. So this is the way the oyster would sit on the bottom. So they have an in-current side and an ex-current side. So on this side, if it were alive, there would be gills and a mantle, and they're taking their water in, taking the, taking the water in, and, they, and oysters can actually move the water. They're not, they're not entirely passive. They can kind of pump the water to take the water in and feed off of it. So they'll take that water in, and they actually use their gills and their mantle to move it down to their mouth parts. And they have an amazing selective ability. Because you can imagine in the water, there's, there's phytoplankton, there's zooplankton, there's a little bit of dirt, for lack of a better word. And they'll actually select through all that. And they'll, the stuff that they don't want, they excrete as what we call pseudo-feces. And the stuff that they want, they'll take into their mouth, and they'll digest it, and then poop it out. So an adult oyster, like say like this oyster, can pump around about 30 gallons of water a day. So extrapolate that out to the millions of oysters that we seed each year, and the millions of oysters that are out there surviving. That's a lot of water quality coming out of, out of the oyster. The, the clam can filter about half of that, scallop about half, also about half. So if you, and that's really why we, it's, a, a, a good land example is the trees. We know that trees purify air, right? And we would never even think about wiping the trees off the earth because we know that we need them for the air. We just saw this issue down the Amazon where much of the Amazon was burning, the lungs of the earth. So uh, the trees are the, the lungs of our, our air and the shellfish are the lungs of the waterways. So, so we're dealing with pseudo feces and feces. The real thing and the fake thing. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm almost there. So, uh, right. So, but the algae, the phytoplankton, is their food. That's what they get their nutrients from and grow from. And how do they sequester nitrogen? 
there's also there's nitrogen also embodied in the in the food. And uh, so they'll, just like we're taking nutrients out of our food to build our muscles and bones and everything else, they're doing the same thing and they're, they're sequestering the nitrogen into the, both their meats and their shell. So that when you, when, you re, when you remove the oyster from the waterway, you're re, removing the, the nitrogen that is sequestered. And of course I ask about the nitrogen because it's such an issue in our surface waters and groundwater today that you know, anything that can remove nitrogen or, or bacteria uh, or phytoplankton is, is so that's how it's purifying the water and um, you, you know the, the gallons the amount that oysters can process is just staggering I, I read a statistic that in New York Harbor uh, in the old days there were enough oysters to process all the water in New York Harbor before the big harvesting started okay so that's good now uh, there's a they're sequestering these elements and nutrients. So, do you feel it's safe to eat raw oysters, Adam? Uh, yes, most definitely. I think one. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think one mis, not even misnomer, or you know, when we talk about how oysters sequester nitrogen, um, I think there's one link that sometimes is forgotten: is that the algae is. What it, in order for algae to uh, divide and prosper, uh, they need nitrogen, just like we all need nitrogen. So it's actually the algae that's taking up this nitrogen um, and then splitting and doing that over and over again. And it's, um, you know, the algae itself is uh, taking that nitrogen and, and using it to make um, it itself. And then the oyster takes that. And so when we talk about excess nitrogen in the water, it's not that the oyster is sucking up nitrogen. No, it's sucking up the algae that took up the nitrogen. And I think that that, that, that piece is, is sometimes missed. That's very helpful, yeah. thank you. So the DEC, our New York State DEC, certifies our waters for shellfish. Um, so do you have confidence in that program that the oysters that are being brought out of our waters are safe to eat? Um, yes, I definitely do. They, they, they run a, a strict program, um, and I, I most definitely do. Yeah, they, have, I mean, they, they have the public safety in mind, and it would reflect very poorly on them if, if someone were to harvest oysters from areas that they certified as safe and they got sick. You know, I uh, graduated from Tulane University in New Orleans, Louisiana. Go Green Wave. And it, the way you threw a party at Tulane is you bought a, you rented a keg of beer and a sack of oysters. And that was the party. That's all you needed. And everyone came, and I only got sick once. It wasn't from the, the oysters, beer, though. <laughs> All right, so we should all feel pretty comfortable and good about uh, eating, eating local, not Louisiana, no, eating local oysters. Um, all right, so let's uh, talk about the oyster itself again. It's one species, the eastern oyster, Crassostria virginica, right? I think I said that right. Um, and uh, yet we have all these varieties. Now we have Lazy Point, we have Robbins Island, we have Blue Point. Ch Chesapeake, you name it. What distinguishes the varieties and how are they developed to be different? Because when you look at them, they are quite different uh, and, and they taste different. Uh, yeah, sure, I'll take that one. Um, so on the east coast of the United States, we're working with the eastern oyster. Um, there, are, um, there are different species uh, that live on the west coast. Um, but in our neck of the woods, what differentiates the, this one species is the body of water that it's grown in. So um, if something that is grown in, let's say, Napique Harbor is going to taste different than Three Mile Harbor, um, one of the reasons for that is just the minerals that are found in each one of these harbors. And so with different minerals, you're going to have a different taste to the oyster. Uh, there's also different populations of phytoplankton in different bodies of water, so that's going to give you a different taste as well. Um, and in terms of the aesthetics of the oyster, um, 
whether the oyster is being grown in a high activity area, so lots of waves and wind and, and just physical motion, uh, is going to change the way it looks if it was kind of grown somewhere where there's it's just there's not a lot of wind in a let's say in a protected cove. Um, and so if an oyster grown where there's a lot of physical wave action is going to have a more rough, maybe even a little bit more heavy, um, and its muscle will also be a little bit stronger just because it's constantly being being rocked. Um, and so that that you know, gener very generally speaking, that what that is what differentiates uh, oysters from Florida up up to Maine. It's just where what body of water. Is anyone familiar with the word terroir? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, there you go. yeah. So we have we have a word for for the marine industry for oysters called merois, based on the same same concept. So you have grapes that are grown in different areas, same species that. Tastes a little different based on the minerality of the soil. So same, same thing with oysters, we just call it marois. All right, so we've got the marois and the different tastes. And, um, but how, is there a certain percent that's marketing here? I mean, is the Robbins Island oyster really that different from the Montauk Pearl? Um, there is definitely marketing involved, but there is a, you will find a, ta a taste difference as well. Um, and I think, um, you know, I, if, if you guys remember from the video, uh, Mike Martin says, was tumbling his oysters. Um, in the lake where he grows, there's not a lot of wave action, so that is an extremely important process for him in order to get a, a deep cup or bottom part or to the oyster. So. Um, yeah, Tom, Tom's an expert. Um, so I lost my train of thought, but the oh, Mike at the lake. Thank you. Yeah. So um, which, with less wave action, you just you, your your oyster is going to look different. Um, and so there is some marketing involved. Of course, you want to differentiate your eastern oyster from somebody else's eastern oyster. Uh, but that comes out uh, also, it comes out with the product itself. Okay, so thank you. That was very helpful. And uh, you know, uh, on a trip to Maine, I did an oyster <coughs> tasting of all these Maine oysters, and they all look different, and they tasted different. And I hope we can have that here in the Peconics and Gardner system, a wonderful array someday of all of the wonderful oysters that you're growing. So... Barley, can you explain this whole month of our <laughs> issue? Because my, you guys work year-round, and you're working really hard, but we used to think we couldn't eat oysters that didn't have R in the month. Okay, yeah, let's, let's, let's discuss the month with R thing. So, months with R, May, June, July, August, right? So they say that you're not supposed to eat oysters during those months. There's, there's a few reasons. One is that those are the warm months, obviously. So there's a, there's a certain bacteria involved in all marine animals that comes into play there. So back in the day, say pre-refrigeration, you get Bayman, Bayman, Bob, and Betty working the, working the oyster grounds and pulling their oysters up onto their boat and just dumping them on the deck, leaving them there. Working all day, working all day. The sun's beating down on those oysters, and there's a per certain bacteria called Vibrio, which is a ubiquitous bacteria that's in those oysters, and as the sun is beating down on them, it's just blooming, proliferating. And, and if, this, if you're immunocompromised or a little bit ill, and you eat some of those oysters with excess Vibrio in them, you might get sick. So nowadays, all this is known. You know, Vibrio is quite well understood. We understand the effects. And keep the shellfish out of the sun. And there's, there's regulations involved, and now all harvesters are, you're either, you've seen folks working in the bay, they have a basket floating behind them, that's one way to mitigate against the Vibrio, is keep them in the, in the water, shade them, put them directly on ice, and voila, we have safe oysters not baking in the sun. So that's one reason. That's the predominant reason, really. Uh, but if, if, you're, if your oysters are handled properly, kept out of the sun, put right on ice, shouldn't be a problem. The other reason is that during those warm months, they also tend to spawn. So 
usually around here, oysters will spawn. I knew we'd get to sex. Yeah, we got lots of sex. Lots of sex talk. Uh, usually around here, oysters spawn around middle of June. So once they once they spawn, they tend to be a little bit watery. Their meats are a little thin. They might not taste as as good as they might taste in the spring or fall. Actually, one of the best times to eat oysters is during one of those Noir months, May, right? Because they're, they're fattening up. It's springtime. The water temperature is about 60 degrees. It's starting to green. They're fattening up, getting ready to spawn. So they're, they're plump and really tasty. May is one of the best times <laughs> to eat oysters. And this time of year, from now to the end of the year, is a great time to eat oysters because they're getting ready for the winter. They're gathering up sugars, getting ready to hibernate, hibernate for the winter. Great time to eat oysters. So there's no reason really not to eat them during those months with R. It might be a personal preference. You might not prefer the watery oyster. Or you might be concerned with taking oysters out of the water that might spawn and produce progeny. But there's, it's, it's really based on the, the Vibrio illness thing. So definitely don't, you know, if you want oysters in July, go for it. Not a, not a problem. No other food brings us closer to the sea, it's been said. So I hope you'll all enjoy the oysters upstairs. So finally, um, Casanova ate 50 oysters for breakfast. <laughs> Romans listed them on their, in their orgy menus. Lord Byron swore by them. And uh, Napoleon as well. <laughs> they have... a. Uh, an ancient, ancient link between oysters and good sex and aphrodisiacal powers. Can we get to the bottom of this as well? Adam, you want to start? Uh, so, Wife's here, be good. <laughs> um, I think they're just, I don't know. I think, it's a, I think, first of all, it's a personal thing whether you eat an oyster and you get... Sex, sensual or whatever, but um, I with I, I kind of had to look into this because I've always wondered myself what what how that connection was made, and I came across an article. It was published in 2005. Um, it was a group of Italian uh, researcher, chemist, and American chemists, and they had to, they wanted to know the same question: What is the deal here? Um, and what this paper said was, without getting into too much detail, because I'm not a chemist, uh, is that there are two amino acids that are, uh, which are you know the building blocks of, of life that are um, uh, in in high concentrations uh, in the oysters um, when they are in fact ready to spawn. And so when we when we uh, consume those oysters. Uh, with the test that they did, um, progesterone and testosterone levels increased in their patients, in their test subject. And so they kind of isolated it to these two particular amino acids that um, uh, you don't usually find in other sources in nature. It's like this is an oyster thing, the <laughs> amino acids that they produce. So, um, you know, that's kind of a boring answer, um, but that's, that is, that's, that's the science behind it, yeah. It's not fake news. What? No effect on women? Yes. No, the progesterone levels also went up. Male and female hormones. Yeah. Well, estrogen. Estrogen, I'm sorry, I got my... Progesterone. I'm sorry, yes. Estrogen. Yes, ma'am, sorry. <laughs> yeah, barley, chime in. I've also heard that since they're high in zinc, that, they'll, that that's, they attribute high zinc to uh, lifting libido, and actually one of my, my veterinarian friends said it actually makes your sperm swim faster. <laughs> so, so there is some science to it, folks. Uh, so eat up, all right. Um, Never blows your hair back. <laughs> Barley, would you just say a word? You didn't mention it in your program, but a word about the community oystering garden program that you're doing, and then we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, there's a few oyster gardeners here. I'm glad to see. So we have... Uh, yeah, raise your hand if you're an oyster gardener. What the heck? Wow. Nice. You're high. Awesome. 
So uh, we have an oyster gardening program in town which allows folks like these folks to grow a thousand oysters at a time. We have four gardens, one's in Three Mile Harbor, one's in Akabonic Harbor, one's in Hog Creek, one's in Napheek Harbor. So we have an educational program that starts in the winter out at the hatchery. We kind of go through our, our educational program kind of follows our season. So we start with the biology talk and we'll go through spawning and how we grow the, the algae, how the nursery works. And then every year around about June, the participants get their batch of their own seed oysters. And they're, they're allowed to grow a thousand at a time. So usually what we do is we give about 900 little baby oysters, which are about five sixteenths in length. And we give them a, a jump start by giving them about 100 one-year-old oysters, which will reach harvest size in the first year. So we kind of set a schedule, give, give guidance as to how to maintain their oysters. Um, and as they, as they reach harvest size, which because they're cultured, they actually don't have a harvest limit. So they can, if you prefer a petite oyster, you can take that home. Um, so the, the idea is to get these folks out in the water, uh, growing oysters, and taking oysters home to eat, giving them to their friends. A thousand oysters is a lot of oysters. And, uh, they give half back. They, yes, and they, they give. So the following season, if you want to if you want to continue your crop, give some back, and then you get a new crop of seed. And you just have a perpetual harvest to take home. So maybe if any of the gardeners want to add to, to their experience, that'd be great too. Okay, well let's get to that at questions then. Um, you guys are doing a fantastic job. Uh, we really appreciate uh, what you're doing for our town and our waters. Thank you for donating oysters to Georgia Capon. Georgia Capon appreciates it. They're doing very well. And now I think we'll open it up to the audience for questions. So I'm going to pass my mic down there and just if you have, want to ask a question, or just speak into the mic, and Barley and Adam can answer, and then just pass, pass the mic around. Uh, thank you. Our, our, our oceans are warming. Our oceans are becoming more acidified. How does that affect the oyster uh, stocks, the growing of the oysters? Um, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, um, so, with the warming of the oceans, I think um, it, I think it depends on where you're located um, to how much your oysters are going to be affected by uh, warming oceans. I think um, one thing that it will do is actually in, increase the length of our growing season, which is kind of a positive. Um, but it also may increase the length of time that a predator of oysters is uh, able to live. Um, and in terms of acidification, um, uh, there's, there was a recent article out of Australia, actually, that, um, so it does, first of all, it does affect the shells of the oysters um, because they're made out of calcium carbonate and a more acidic ocean is gonna make for uh, a more frail uh, oyster, and it'll just be harder for the oyster itself to actually produce its, its shell. Um, but there's research coming out that um, oysters are actually uh, able to adapt to increasing ocean acidifications. Um, it's not on um, you know huge concentration increases, but um, they're able from generation to generation to pass on. Uh, what's called epigenetics uh, to help the next generation deal with the changing environment over a course of one generation, two generations. Um, but generally speaking, it, it's not a, it's not a good thing if it continues um, at a at a quick rate. Um, we we will see effects on our farms. So. Um my favorite oyster meal is oysters Rockefeller. I'd like to know what your favorite method of preparation of oysters is. <laughs> question number one. And question number two, I have millions of oyster shells and I'd like to know what to do with them. <laughs> Besides okay. using them in my driveway. And do, do, you, do you have a favorite, um, uh, most creative usage of oyster shells that you could share with us? So, first of all, we will take your 
uh, oysters, right? In the shoals. Yeah. Um, so we can coordinate that. Um, I get a couple questions in there. Oh, so raw is my favorite uh, for sure. Um, second to that is is Rockefeller for sure. Um, and you had another question. No. No, usage of oyster shells. Oh, usage. Um, uh, you know, one thing we use the oyster shells for is we actually grind grind them up to create a, a very fine um, sand almost, and we use that to have the larval oysters as a as a place to set. So they'll a larval oyster will set on one of those uh, grains um, and start the metamorphosis. We did have an oyster shell recycling program last year. So Keeper's here. She, she helped us with that along with John Aldred, and um, it's we we can use it in the hatchery along with what Adam said. We can grind them up into small pieces, so we end up with an individual oyster, or we can keep them whole and and set a bunch of oysters on one shell, and that's what say Billion Oyster Pro Project does. If Pete was here, he could speak to that. But uh, it's a really good way to to restore oyster reefs or to stabilize shorelines, kind of bunch them all together, because what you end up with is a, a big clump of oysters as opposed to just a single oyster. So we can take those oyster shells, put them in bags, set oysters on them in the hatchery in the lab setting, and as the oysters grow, they kind of grow together and solidify almost, if you will. And uh, again, that's another thing that creates amazing habitat. We're growing some now for the governor's shellfish project initiative and uh, we had some growing off of the bulkhead in Three Mile Harbor and the, the, those oyster bags were just teeming with grass shrimp and nursery fish, even eels swimming in and out of them so it's just like any place else, you provide habitat where there otherwise isn't any and things will come but uh, we, we, we hope to continue the oyster shell recycling program next year so we'll hopefully get the word out to you as to where to bring them um, Sarah and uh, Barley and Adam, thanks so much for coming this evening. Um, I am an oyster farmer, and my oyster farm is in uh, Nepeg, my crate. And I wanted to ask you um, about the educational aspect of this, because I am on the Committee for Education, and I think it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for children as well as adults to come down to the shellfish hatchery. And uh, one of the things that we're going to be doing next week, if you could talk about that for the uh, children in school... I think it's a great opportunity for everybody in this room and if you have children or grandchildren to get involved with the shellfish hatchery. I've learned so much and uh, I just want to address the educational aspect and have you talk about that to our audience, to your audience. Yeah, thanks. We do offer tours at the hat at wherever, whatever stage we are in during the season. Uh, we have school groups that come out to the hatchery during the school season and they can check out our growing algae and we always have something to show them under the microscope, whether it's algae or a larval oyster or clam. Um, we, can do, we do tours of the nursery with Project Most. The nursery's up on Three Mile Harbor, and that's all land-based stuff. And then during the fall, we can do tours at the, at the field site in Napeeg Harbor, which, which incorporates a boat ride, which is always fun. And next week, uh, like Susan said, we're, we're doing a seating event with Surf Rider where the kids are going to meet us at Northwest Creek one afternoon. We're going to bring a whole bunch of oysters. They're going to paddle around on paddle boards and, and seed the oysters on the bottom uh, in one of our seeding spots. So, yeah, we're, we're part of our, our mission is to get kids in and show them around. And it's amazing how you, you kind of think at the, at the hatchery stage, you kind of think that things are kind of abstract, but even the kids really seem to get a lot out of it. And especially, it's, it's even better if they can come later in the season and, and see the more tangible, larger oysters and clams. It really kind of puts everything into perspective. Yeah, if, you, if you've never seen a larval shellfish, clam, or oyster, it, it is, it's, it's really cool to see it under a microscope because it does not look anything like its adult face. I just wondered how this was all funded. How is this funded? How is the town hatchery funded? Uh, way back in the beginning, back in the 80s, uh, Mario Cuomo gave the hatchery a grant 
it was about $168,000 to renovate the building that we're in now, which is an old Navy building. Really interesting building, huge, and we've we've made the best of it by building a hatchery inside this building. So originally uh, that grant was given to us, and we paid it back with with shellfish. Actually, for 25 years we gave the state 10% of our production. So that was a payback, not a bad deal. Um, and now we we're generally funded by the town, so we're we're a town department. We're in the town budget, and we also get grants occasionally when they're available. Oh uh, yeah, good one. So we started in 2016 uh, with 15 gardeners, and now these guys started. Who else was there the first year? Yeah, William. Uh, with 15 gardeners at Three Mile Harbor, and now we have the four sites, and we're up to about a hundred. And we have a few people that actually. It's a good point. If you have your, if you actually have a dock in certified waters, you can grow oysters off your own dock. So get in touch with me, and we'll get you set up. It's a really awesome opportunity. I mean, what's better than oysters floating off your dock? I got one quick question. Um, during this growing season, is there a time when there's a big algal bloom and the regulatory agencies call you up and say, hey, we've got an issue and you ever have to address things like that? We are very lucky in that we've never had algae bloom issues because our, our field grow out site, during the season where algae blooms are a problem, the majority of our crop is out of Napi. And uh, Napi Harbor, I would, I would never say never, but I want to say never in my time has had a harmful algae bloom. We do have the occasional red tide in Three Mile Harbor, and uh, we just try to keep tabs on the news. And I've uh, never actually gotten a, a, a phone call, but uh, you know, like many people and anybody who's into shell fishing, you should sign up for the DEC newsletters, and they'll, they'll shoot you an email if there's ever a closure. Uh, but we, we knock on wood have since the brown tide have never really had an issue with harmful algae because our water quality is so good out here and also because a lot of our waters, since we're out of the east end, we have this oceanic influence which helps with keeping our waters clean. You had mentioned earlier the predators of oysters. Who are the predators? Um, so we are the predators. And then, <laughs> then there are, you know, so it, it differs as the as they get older. Um, so when they're kind of swimming in the water column as larvae, that is, uh, their predator is going to be any any fish that can see it and just kind of eat it. Um, and then after that. Um, the, one of the main predators is actually called an oyster drill, um, and it, it's a snail, and they will uh, basically come onto your oyster and start drilling a hole and eat it from the outside. Yeah. Um, blue crab, crabs, crabs, tons of crab, yeah, blue Starting. crabs, um, tog hog, conch. Um, Oyster catcher, which is a bird, called an oyster catcher. Yeah. What's that? Starfish. 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 Yeah, Starfish. which yeah. that's. And uh, I want to tell an interesting story that Kim, I don't know if anybody knows Kim Tatro. He works for Cornell. He's the guy that actually started the oyster gardening program on the East End. He always tells a story, it's a very funny story, and it's a, it argues for understanding animal biology. So way back in the day when starfish, when fishermen were pulling up these starfish in their nets, one of the things they had on their boat, aside from their nets and maybe a couple hooks, was a machete. So they'd be pulling up these nets and they're just laden with starfish, doing all kinds of damage. So they put that starfish down and start hacking it up in little pieces. So who knows what happens when you do that? Regenerate. So once they figured out, oh, that's not such a great idea, they stopped doing that, and then they actually used mops, huge mops, and just scraped the bottom, and you know the little spines on the back of starfish, literally mopped them up off the bottom, and that's part of the reason why you really don't see many starfish out here. They are a big predator, and they they just put their their starfish legs around a, a clam or an oyster and just. Slowly, with slow, light pressure, just 
pry it open and then eat it up. And uh, where, where is your farm, number one, and then talk to me about Northwest Creek. Um, so my farm is located in Napi Bay or Gardner's Bay. Um, it's the southern portion of Gardner's Bay, um, kind of off of, uh, if you guys are familiar with the fish farm, yeah. um, yeah. it's, it's in that vicinity. Oh, okay. uh, North, so Northwest Creek is the easternmost East Hampton Creek or harbor of East Hampton jurisdictions. So that's the easternmost creek that we seed shellfish in. Um, it's mostly seasonally open to shellfish. Pardon? Western. 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 Did I say? Yeah, I got, I'm sorry. <laughs> Western. Um, so yes, it's the westernmost East Hampton <laughs> water body and it's mostly it's only seasonally open to shellfish so you can't go in there in the middle of summer you have to wait till the, the cold season but we see uh, oysters on the flat and some clams on the west side and the west month, side what month would side. that open up then pardon what month would that be opening up uh, usually I have to double check but it's usually November 1st through end of March it'd be a little bit hardy but like I said before it's a really great time of year to eat shellfish. Hmm. It's a beautiful spot. Too. Is it common for the uh, the oysters to uh, suck in like cra crabs in the shell itself? I, suppose I bought oysters once and shuck in them. There was little small tiny crabs in them. I thought there was something more wrong with them, but it was uh, fine. No, so that, that, that is the pea crab, right? Mm -hmm. um, it is a, um, <laughs> it's not, it, it's fine for you to eat that oyster with a, right. with a pea crab in there. Um, they're not ideal, I don't believe, for the, for the oysters, that correct? Now, we used to think they were kind of commensal, sort of like the, uh, ox, ox, those, those birds on, on the, ox peckers, ox peckers on, peckers. on the, on the, Ungulates that they clean, they clean them. But now we've, we're recently really discovering that they're kind of a pest, as you can imagine. A um, little crab crawling around in there. There's not a whole lot of space. <laughs> um, you see them pretty often in scallops, and it's it's another again, it's a regional thing. There's some areas that are just loaded with them. Um, I haven't seen them a whole lot around here, but there's definitely pockets, and I've seen them in scallops and the peconics. But and you can eat them. Okay. We so did. if you accidentally you do, <laughs> kind of like popcorn, I imagine. I actually have a couple of questions. Nobody's mentioned pearls. Oh, don't pearls come from oysters, or don't oysters do something so to glad. pearls? So once I brought props for that question. <laughs> <laughs> so this, maybe this can help answer your question. This, the one on the bottom is an actual pearl oyster. This is a black lip pearl oyster uh, from the Solomon Islands, and this is an eastern oyster. So what's the main difference? The interior. So this stuff here, the interior coating is called the knacker. On this one, it's really beautiful. If you catch it in the light, there's kind of an iridescence. So that's what makes the pearl. They, when, a, when a foreign body gets in there, a lot of people say sand. It's really not often sand. It can actually be that pea crab, or maybe that pea crab lost a leg. And kind of like how we scar over, the oyster will scar over with the knacker, thus building a pearl. So you can imagine a pearl out of this stuff is really beautiful. I mean, it's amazing. Out of this, not so much. So... <laughs> These guys can make pearls. I mean, uh, those that have, that have shucked a lot of oysters, even clams. Just this year, this year, actually, I saw two really beautiful clam pearls that were purple, of uh, the clam wampum. And they were round, and one of them was the size of a pea, and the other one was about maybe half the size of a pea. So you can get them, and those, those will actually be worth some money. And they're worth, definitely worth mounting and wearing. But So the, the short answer is, it, it all comes down to the knacker. Uh, so a pearl out of this stuff is, I mean, might as well mount up a piece of chalk. It looks the same. <laughs> but a pearl out of this is just pure beauty. I did have a second question, which was silly, but uh, nobody's mentioned, uh, well, 
Does size matter? <laughs> you know, you order you order oysters and you get little petite ones and then you get big ones on the same plate. You know, I think uh, it, it's a it's a personal preference. I know with my with my oysters, they do taste different when they're smaller compared to when they're they're larger. Um, and, you know, and if you're an oyster gardener, you get to choose when you bring them home. Uh, if you if you like the the smaller tasting ones, but um, it is a uh, personal preference, really. Okay, well, great questions from the audience. Thank you so much. We'll uh, go upstairs and enjoy some real oysters.